Um, so I'm some months late with my next update. Well, the reason is that I'm getting one of these in Sweden, and it took way more time than I thought. Yep, that thing is going to be an even bigger European vivarium than before. I can't wait to show you the final results. It will be like the Thai vivarium, but a European one. The upload will come sometime next year. This time we will delve even deeper into all the organisms and the ecology of the tank, striving to progressively identify and create a huge food web of all the animals within. Some of the animals or organisms are already prepared to move in. I have even founded a parasitic ant colony of Lassius umbratus and other ant species, plants, amphibians, arachnids, isopods and much more. But time will come for these guys to shine in or on the channel. You can also let me know in the comments if you have any suggestions. I will read and consider them all. Or even better, you could sign up on this forum that I've made for vivarium creators such as us where we can all chat about practically anything, although try to add to the right categories, guys. I plan to update on my vivariums and plants here in the future, a little more in depth with updates here and there. More about this one in the next video. Same for the Instagram, at NordicAnts. Although as a payback for my update delay, I thought I would share my extremely cool trip to Nepal and the Himalayas filled with cool natural experiences and the main theme is how nature changes on different altitudes because I literally hiked from a tropical jungle to an arctic climate seeing organisms all the way up Ew, what is this cow? Um, hello? Anyways, so for you that don't know, Nepal is here and as you see it is located near the equator and even at the same level as warm countries such as Florida or North Africa but as guest, because of its elevation and mountains, the climate is quite different. I remember looking at ant maps before the trip to figure out what kind of ants live there, which also gives me a clue on what to expect climate and nature wise. But for the first time ever I was really confused. First I saw Caribora diversa, the Asian army ant. These guys I know pretty well from Thailand and they enjoy tropical jungles, but then I saw Formica fusca. What what I know these well I know these guys too, but from Sweden. Lacius Bruneus as well. And then I finally saw trap shell ant species, as well as weaver ants. Both species found in tropical Thailand. I knew some species were more adapted to the colder climates in the Himalayas. But small, trivial Swedish Lacius ants living alongside Trapjaw, Weaver and Army ants sounds out of this world. But all I had to do now was to get there and see for myself. In the country and breathing the air of the mountain I immediately started lifting various stones. Finding cool earwigs, chilling ants in colonies doing their usual stuff and even reptiles but nothing really remarkable. Except the insane scenery. I started to feel like Frodo in Lord of the Rings at times but looking for insects instead of Mordor of course. The forest here was lush and rich in tropical flora of all sorts, but the presence of fauna was not what I had anticipated. But not to worry, we continued upwards the hillside and it was all soon to change. On the steep hillside or in small villages where the trees could not grow properly, grasslands full of flowers prospered and as most of us know, they would not be able to do so without their pollinators. The airspace was full of flying organisms, bzz, 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 all over the place. And no, not you, but yeah, you get what I mean. I don't know why they prospered such masses here on the higher altitude instead of in the warmer tropical climate, which should speed up their metamorphosis. There should be many explanations, such as seasons, more flowers up in the trees where I couldn't see them, and fiercer competition with other organisms. But yeah, I was spoiled. Have a look at all the moths I found near a lamp just by 
our camping site in the morning. I found a super interesting article explaining, or rather exploring, the moth diversity in the mountainous regions, such as these. The main factors were obviously the topography, but also vegetation and seasonality. As guessed, the incredible diversity in moths gave way for an equal one in caterpillars, all of them feeding in order to metamorphosize and spread their wings in these wonderlands. The diurnal moths, also known as the butterflies, were also present, but in less spectacular numbers and diversity. But still, pretty cool. The absolute pro with all these moths all over the place was that I could do so much Gandalfy stuff, but... God damn it, my eagles never came! <clears throat> Continuing, I saw beetle larvae, and mostly dead beetles all over the place. Ants were also present, and I finally saw what I'd come for. Here are fadal ants, as you can see, with their huge majors. No species of this genus exists in Sweden, but they prosper in south of Europe as fadal pallidula, and as most of my subscribers know, in my Thai vivarium as well. A typical genus of ant that I expected to see and encounter here in Nepal. I saw a bunch of rather generic looking ants that without a doubt all have their own interesting natural specializations and stories, but soon I started to recognize ants. This Camponotus worker looked almost identical to our Camponotus species that we had in our Swedish vivarium. Talking about convergent evolution, I think this is a great example, if they don't have a too much of a common ancestor, of course. Here's also a cool ant from the genus Aphenogaster. I saw loads of these. Lastly, I saw, just as we read on ant maps, the incredible Trapjaw ant, this time belonging to the species Bruneus, and not Monticola, which was the only species ant maps had added. I would have to email them and tell them to add this species to Nepal. The diversity of ants was spectacular, in my opinion, because the mix of the species normally living in colder climates with tropical climate species was something weird. This must also be the case for other animals, such as moths or butterflies. Unfortunately, I don't know equally much about them. The climate here was very interesting as well, as even though it wasn't monsoon season, the air was always really humid and the various streams were always here and there. I thought about this a lot, and soon realized that this was because we were actually wandering in the clouds. The mountains actually collided with the clouds, causing them to precipitate the water they were made of. Many epiphytes and other mosses took a huge advantage of this, making the forest here just incredible. The Himalayas is basically stealing all the water from the rest of Tibet on the other side. It's really a dramatic thing. You can see the insane desert mainly caused by the cloud blockage from the Himalayas. Further up, the fauna almost disappeared, and the flora persisted with a few robust-looking species. According to the current science, the plants keep their leaves smaller in the colder climates to avoid frost damage which from a physical perspective is quite obvious. Each one of these plants have found a perfect leaf type that can both photosynthesize and resist frost. Amazing. Here are some berries too that in a miraculous way manages to grow up here. Credit to these guys. I am going to end this video with a musical compilation with the rest of the magnificent organisms and physical environments that I have encountered. But don't forget to stick around for the huge Revarium update that will air next year. See you next time and have a fantastic day.